engine cooling. Why is it important? I'm about to try to explain why. A lot of it has to do with this graph right in front of you. Reciprocating engine is a heat machine. That means we turn chemical energy in the form of 100 low lead or blue gold aviation fuel into heat. Now about half that heat is gonna go out through the exhaust. The other half is going to be lost in cooling or is going to be actual useful work, making the airplane go. Because we produce so much heat and so little of it is used to make the airplane function, we have to get rid of it somehow. That's where cooling comes in. If you remember back to your reciprocating engine lessons, we have lubricating oil, which travels through the inside of the engine. It will lubricate things as well as make heat go away by means of conduction. However, we can only transfer that heat to different areas of the engine in some cases an oil cooler, but that's not enough to get the engine completely cooled. What we need is a way to cool it down the rest of the way. Why do we need it to be so cool? Well, number one, we can cause issues with our fuel air charge. Overheating can diminish the lubrication properties of the oil we use. It can also uh, cause parts to damage prematurely. And on the other hand, if we have too hot of a fuel air charge because the engine is overheating, it can lead to situations like detonation or knocking. Both are bad. How do we do it? With these fins. We have cast fins on the head of the cylinder and we have machined fins on the barrel of the cylinder. These are all used for air cooling. Air cooling just means that we force air to go past the cylinders. It travels in between these nice little fins right there and carries heat away from the engine. Now the difference between cast fins and machined fins, other than the fact that one is cast and one is machined, Machine fins, like I said, will be on the barrel. Cast fins will tend to be on the head. Those cast fins are more delicate, which means if we try to bend those cast fins back and forth, if they are bent, they're most likely going to crack closer to the base and kill the cylinder. On the other hand, with the machine fins, you can straighten these out if they get bent just a little bit because they're a little more uh, resilient than the cast fins. So go ahead and bend to your heart's content. Now, we have these fins out here to capture airflow and increase the surface area to cool the engine. You're going to see more fins in hotter parts of the engine, which means mostly around the exhaust valve and mostly around your spark plugs is where you'll see the largest concentration by surface area of cooling fins. With these cooling fins, to make sure that air flows through, we use deflectors and baffles. The idea is that the deflectors will cause air to flow closely to the cylinder and thereby flow through the fins that help to transport away heat. But we can't just hang this thing out in the air and hope that we're going to get enough airflow to make it happen. That is where good cowl design comes in. The idea being that we get air coming in through the front of the cowl, highly pressurized because of the ram air impact as the aircraft flies, and it can exit through the aft of the cowling through either an opening or through controllable cowl flaps. This system is referred to as pressure cooling. We use air pressure differential on either side of the baffles to create cooling airflow. The way this works is by using air seals and baffles. So we have the front of our cowling right up here where air enters in. These seals right here will help to keep it sealed off against the cowling so that we don't have air bypassing. Now you could see these oval shaped ones However, much more commonly, you'll probably see just sheets which are pressed up against the cowling, kind of like so. When these get installed, these get installed so that they bend forward toward the front of the aircraft. That way we don't have any sneaky air try to blow its way between the cowl and the seal. This baffle acts as a dam and it forces air to flow through these deflectors around the cylinders. And in some cases, if we have a spark plug on the back of the engine where airflow is tougher to get to, we may have it incorporated in the deflector or we may use a blast tube to direct airflow directly onto that spark plug and help keep it cool. The idea is we create an area of high pressure in front of the baffle and we create an area of low pressure behind the baffle to promote good airflow. One way we can help this out is by using an augmenter system. Now, this is with an older radial engine, but the concept is the same. The way it works is the augmenter actually helps to create an area of low pressure at the back of the cowling, and it's all about airflow trickery. So the idea is that we have our exhaust right over here that gets sent into our augmenter. Now, the exhaust pipe does not run all the way down the length. It actually stops partially inside. The reason being is exhaust will come out of the stack 
it's going to expand to fill the space of this augmenter and thereby become less dense. It's also moving quite a bit faster because it's being exhausted out of the engine. The idea is that area of low pressure is going to create a bit of a vacuum out through the aft of the augmenter, which is going to help draw in more cooling air from the front of the engine. That's not limited to radial engines. We can see a similar uh, installation in smaller aircraft engines as well. They aren't quite as big, they aren't quite as long, but the concept is the same. We have our augmenter tubes at the aft of the engine right here. We eject exhaust, as you can see, directly into that augmenter tube, and that expansion of air, along with the velocity, is going to help promote airflow coming in through the front of the cowl, around the baffles and deflectors, and out through the aft of the engine. Different way to look at this, so we can see the two areas. We can see our defining line right here, where we have our baffle, we have our deflectors around the cylinders, and we have another baffle, which is preventing airflow. And you can see in both cases, the seal is angled towards the high pressure area, right? So because we have ram air coming in through the inlet, this is going to be our high pressure area, and then we have our low pressure area down here. We can manage that pressure differential inside the cowling using cowl flaps right down here. Those flaps simply close to create a higher zone of pressure behind the baffle. It opens to create a lower area of pressure behind the baffle. As a result, if the cowl flaps are open, it will perform increased cooling. If they are closed, it will decrease the amount of cooling. So it would stand to reason if an aircraft is running on the ground with very little airflow, the cowl flaps are always almost always, going to be wide open. However, in flight, those are typically going to be cooled. The pilot are uh, closed uh, for cooling. The pilot needs to manage those cowl flap positions as the aircraft climbs and as it descends. If the cowl flaps are not managed properly, especially on descent, then it can result in what we refer to as shock cooling of the engine, which effectively just means we cool the engine down too quickly and we can potentially cause things to break as a result. The other way of cooling something, if we aren't using air cooling, is liquid cooling. Liquid cooling functions off the same concept. We are taking heat away by conduction and we are sending it somewhere else away from the engine to remove it from the power plant. An advantage of liquid cooling is that you can have a much more streamlined cowling for the aircraft and it can be used for a couple other options if we're using coolant heat. However, it adds extra weight and complexity, so in most cases, you will not see liquid cooled systems on aircraft. However, uh, for proof of concept, effectively we have coolant that is going to flow in jackets through the engine block, flowing past the cylinder barrels, other critical components of the engine, and by conduction, it's going to take that heat and it is going back to our radiator. Our radiator is gonna have air flowing through it, and just like we have with cowl flaps in a pressure cooling system, we have a regulatory door on the back right here, which can open and close to increase or decrease the amount of air that flows through the radiator. More air flowing through the radiator means it's going to cool more effectively. It'll drop the temperature of the coolant more before it returns to the engine. On the other hand, if the door is closed more, then we'll have reduced airflow, less cooling. And in most cases, when you have a radiator set up like this, you'll have a control device oh, somewhere up here that actually acts as a thermostat and will regulate the position of the door for the pilot with a, a system of that complexity. Typically for liquid-cooled systems, we're going to use some form of ethylene glycol, or if you see it in the store, you know, typically Prestone or some other like brand name of coolant. But the thing about ethylene glycol is it's very good at carrying heat uh, by transmission. It's miscible with water, which means once you mix it in, it doesn't separate when it sits, and it resists freezing at low temperatures. So depending on the expected range of operation, you use a different mixture of ethylene glycol to water to prevent uh, any ice crystals forming or freezing of the coolant while it's in operation. Uh, but again, happens pretty rarely in aviation. You won't use it very often, but it is out there and it's good to know about. Next up, when we talk about temperature, we have to track temperature. Typically, you're going to see two kinds of temperature probes. You'll get this gasket type, which is just a spark plug gasket that sits between the spark plug and the cylinder head. The idea is if we have one probe, we're going to put it on the hottest cylinder, which is typically going to be the rear cylinder, the one furthest away from the intake air. And we're going to make sure that once we buy that, we do not trim it and try to uh, 
adjust it in any way because it's usually based upon a set resistance for that entire sensor. So we don't want to trim it. We don't want to shorten it up. Don't want to try to patch in any other wires to make it longer because that will throw off its reading. The other version is what we call a bayonet type probe, which actually screws directly into the cylinder head. So on most cylinder heads, you'll look near the range of the spark plug, there's gonna be a little plug or just an empty hole. That's where that bayonet plug is going to install. And it takes a little more accurate reading since it actually sticks into the cylinder head. Last version is our exhaust gas temperature probes. Uh, same deal with these. They're going to be based on a specific resistance uh, of that entire cable, so we can't lengthen it or shorten it, but they just poke right into a hole in the exhaust system, and that is going to give us a uh, reading on the temperature exiting the exhaust stacks. So as we talk about cooling systems, the uh, beach over here is probably a good place to start. Very basic, but it makes it pretty easy to see what we're looking at, and really... A lot of this is about figuring out how to get yourself oriented when you're trying to inspect, trying to see what's going on, and gives you a better idea of how this thing works when it's actually on an airplane instead of just a diagram. So as we approach the aircraft, you'll notice on either side, we have the two main inlets right here that allow air while the aircraft is in flight or uh, air brought in by the propeller while it's on the ground to flow in into the engine compartment. Now, as we move over, you'll notice we have traditional air-cooled cylinders, right? Most engines you see in aviation are going to be air-cooled. Uh, very, very infrequently will you see liquid-cooled engines. So as a result, you're going to get very familiar with seeing a lot of fins on cylinders and a lot of baffling setups inside the cowling. Ultimately, the cowling is supposed to do two jobs, at least in the case we're talking about. It's supposed to keep the aircraft streamlined, and it's also supposed to help air flow through so it can help cool the engine a little bit better. So effectively what we see here, if you take a look at this back baffle here and you can see this rub line along the top of these valve covers here, it matches this baffle seal we see up the top. So effectively this baffle seal comes down, it seals up here and it seals right down here. What that does is it gives us, uh, let's call it an A and B chamber. Up here in the A chamber is where we have ram air entering into the aircraft cowling. And then the B chamber down here is outside of this initial sealed zone, which is going to exit through the bottom of the cowling. Now, the reason that this is helpful and the reason it's something that we put on air cooled engines to help is because this forces all of this ram air to get directed through the cooling fins on the cylinder and help cool things down. And as you look at the cylinder, you'll see physically there are more cooling fins or more cooling fin surface on areas where it's going to tend to get a little bit hotter. You can even see these passages uh, going underneath the rocker box to get air down to the bottom spark plugs, which are uh, sometimes difficult uh, to be able to cool. In other cases, we may see blast tubes coming off of the baffling. They'll direct airflow down to those uh, bottom or rear spark plugs, depending on your configuration. But as we look at this, that's really all it does. Brings in this ram air, seals it in this area, and forces it to have to travel past these cooling fins. Now, on the other side, as soon as we exit through the cylinders, you'll notice down here, I'll grab a flashlight so it's a little bit easier to see. You'll notice down here, we have the exit where our cowl flap is. Now, the cowl flap is pretty straightforward in that what it does is it opens and closes in order to regulate how much air is exiting this cowl. So we bring ram air in. Uh, if these cowl flaps are closed, it's gonna cause more pressure to build up in the top half. If we open these cowl flaps, and it's going to allow air to flow more freely uh, out of the uh, uh, cowling. And as a result, it's gonna allow more airflow through these cylinders. So as a result, if we have an aircraft that's running hot, we're gonna to tend to have the cowl flaps open more. If it is running cool, the cowl flaps are gonna be closed more. And that's how we can regulate temperature in flight and on the ground. Now, the other thing you'll notice, as we take a look over here, you see we have our exhaust system and we have our exhaust pipe, which is exiting through the cowl flap, which makes sense. We would have exhaust exit through a space where there's an opening. But part of what this helps do is you'll notice that this extends quite a bit out. And what that does is as hot gas is exiting the exhaust system, it actually creates kind of a area of low pressure and encourages more air to get drawn through these cowl flaps. So it's kind of a, a two for one in terms of getting cooling for the engine. 
as we talk about inspection uh, just a little bit when you walk up to this and take a look obviously we're looking primarily at overall condition of all these cylinders so that means we're looking at fins we're looking for cracks we're looking for chips we're looking for deformed fins you can see a little crack or a little chip right there it could have been a uh, crack at one point in time that took the corner off now if you do have missing fin that's not necessarily a problem each manufacturer will have different regulations for how much can be removed uh, from one of these cylinders and still provide adequate cooling and it can be any combination of things it can be one fin is completely gone it can be adjacent fins it could be length of a crack which uh, can be stop drilled there's a number of different ways to fix these so if it does get damaged it's not the end of the world but it is a good thing to avoid the other thing you'll notice around here is we have our baffle material uh, that seals against our baffle seal. So this is usually just going to be a very light aluminum. In fact, right here you can see an area where you have some chafing and it's actually worn through. So that would probably require a doubler patch just to keep that from progressing any further. If we did see any cracks on the baffle, then they could potentially be stop drilled. And realistically, if you look at an airplane that's been in service for any amount of time, you're going to find a lot of stop drilled cracks on these baffles. Up here, we have our baffle seal, and this is getting a little bit old and crusty. Usually it should be fairly pliable. It's going to be made of a flame proof material. You have to be careful. Uh, some of the older versions of baffle material is not real good for you since they tried to make it flame proof. But uh, newer models are going to be usually some kind of silicone with fiberglass and they tend to uh, not get too hard and crispy over time from the heat. But as they start to get crispy, as they start to crack, these are just right on the edge of wanting to break off. So we'd be getting pretty close to replacing these seals. The idea is you want them to stay pliable. You don't want to see a lot of tearing or ripping. You want to see that they're securely fastened to the material that uh, they're riveted or uh, screwed to so that that way when we bring it in contact we get a nice tight seal and it doesn't break anything off and get lost inside our engine compartment so that's what it looks like out in the wild and uh, makes a little bit of sense once you see it in person but this is a very basic system expect to see more cooling systems like this on the aircraft you'll be working on